guys! Welcome to your first lesson in Foundations of Environmental Systems and Societies. Today we are going to start talking about the history of the environmental movement. In the textbook, in Oxford Press, Environmental Systems and Societies, 1.1 is called Environmental Value Systems, but we're going to break it up into two parts. So if you're following along, we're just doing the very beginning of 1.1 today. Um, so let's get started. First, I want you to consider the major events in your life that you feel have really shaped you as a person. Maybe you moved when you were a kid. Maybe you decided where you want to go to college. Maybe you did a summer camp that was really meaningful to you. The same way that people's lives are shaped by important events, so are theological movements. So when we talk about the history of the environmental movement, we are going to talk first about some of the major things that have happened that have um, taken the environmental movement to where it is today. So the first was the agricultural revolution, and this is when human societies shifted from hunter-gatherer cultures to agriculture, and it really shaped the way that we live in the world, and prepared us for the industrial revolution, which is when people shifted from agriculture into factory work. Um, and this is significant for the environmental movement because during the Industrial Revolution, we really changed our relationship with the resources on the planet and started using resources in a much more intensive way. Then came the Green Revolution, which is a little bit of a misnomer. I think it's better when people call this the modern agricultural revolution because what this actually was was a shift to industrial farming. So I think to call it the Green Revolution sounds like a little bit misleading, like it was something more positive than it was. It was positive in the aspect that we were able to produce food for our growing world population, but in terms of environmental impact, it was pretty significant. This was when people started developing stuff like GMOs and labor-intensive farming techniques and mega farms insecticides and pesticides were used really heavily. So um, this had a big effect on the environment. The next thing that happened that really affected the environmental movement was the 1960s in the United States when people started to form nonprofit organizations and look at the environment in a different way. It was sort of like the free love generation going back to their environmental roots. Um, so this was when organizations like Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Federation were formed, and they continue to this day to have a significant impact on how we view the environment. Then you can look at environmentalism today. And environmentalism today, if I had to give this a revolution name, I would really call it the media revolution. Because now that we are consuming our media from sources like Netflix and Facebook, the information that we receive is really specialized. And if you're interested in environmental issues, there's a wealth of information out there for you. You can watch specialized television shows. You can join chat groups. You can surf websites on the green web. Um, so... It's really like this becoming this very specialized niche market of environmentalism. Um, and that's where we are at today. Some of the smaller things that have influenced the environmental movement over time include books and movies. So this started in the 1800s with Thoreau writing Walden. This here is a picture of the Walden Pond and the idea that it's significant for people to go out into nature and live intentionally. That was Thoreau's big thing. Um, John Muir quickly followed up as a really important nature writer in the early part of the 1900s. He was famous for conservation in the Sierras in California um, and doing a lot of hiking and sort of naturalist thinking and writing. Aldo Leopold and a Sand County Almanac in the 50s. This is a beautiful book about trying to live off the land. These were all sort of like inspired by the beauty of nature. In the 60s, you see this swing into more scientific writing. Rachel Carson and James Lovelock came out with two really significant ecological books. Rachel Carson's book was Silent Spring. This was about the dangers of DDT and the thinning of eggshells. 
And James Lovelock's uh, book, The Gaia Hypothesis, was all about feedback loops in the planet. And we are going to talk a lot about feedback loops in a future class. So stay tuned for that. But the Gaia Hypothesis is based around the idea that all the systems in the world are connected. Um, so these are really like ecologically based and scientific. And then you see in the 2000s, these ideas, these scientific ideas becoming a little bit more mainstream with really important documentary filmmaking by Al Gore and Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, there's a sequel out to, to An Inconvenient Truth that came out, I think, just about two years ago called An Inconvenient Sequel that's also very good. Al Gore is like a tireless um, climate change advocate and a good person to follow. He's written a lot of good books and he's produced now these two very good movies. So all of these books and movies have influenced how we think about the environment. Also, policy decisions influence how we think about the environment. In the 30s, there was FDR. There's FDR right there with his creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps in the United States. This was the group that made all of the national parks um, and created the National Park Service. Here is a picture of Yosemite down here. Um, and this really influenced how Americans, at least, see nature. And the national park system in the United States quickly became like a blueprint for national park systems all over the world. In the 70s, you had the first UN Earth Summit. So the idea that environmental policy on a global scale was really important. In 1975, you had another United Nations group form the... CITES Agreement, which is about the tr international trade of endangered species. Um, in 1987, the world saw the Montreal Protocol, which was about CFCs and ozone depletion. This is widely regarded as the most successful piece of environmental legislation that has ever been seen in the world, and we will study this more in Unit 6. Um, in 1992, you had the Rio Earth Summit and the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol was about CO2 emissions. This was like where the idea of a carbon trading cap was invented. Um, and then, of course, in 2015, you had the Paris Climate Agreement. So all of these different pieces of environmental legislation have, <laughs> excuse me, have shaped how individuals see the world and also have... Um, um, colored the interaction that we have with policymakers. So they've all been really significant. And then the next thing that, of course, develops the environmental movement is environmental disasters. So extinctions of major animals, big weather events, big chemical leaks, and power plant failures, all of those things get a lot of press coverage and shape how we see the world around us. A lot of times we don't know the danger of a substance until something goes wrong. For example, in the Minamata Bay disaster, this was all about mercury poisoning. And this fishing village in Japan, they didn't know that a factory was putting lethal levels of mercury out into their water and that fish would eat the mercury and then people could get mercury poisoning from eating the fish. So this was a big deal, the Minamata Bay disaster in the 60s in Japan. Um, the Bhopal disaster at the Union Carbide plant in 1984 in India was one of the first times that there was a really significant industrial problem over land in a town. And this resulted in major birth defects and death in the area and raised awareness about the idea of worker safety. And then Chernobyl, of course, was about nuclear energy production. Um, Chernobyl was a power plant in the Ukraine that had a major, major meltdown in 1986. There's still a lot of radioactivity that happens in that area. And this really brought the question of how do we have sustainable power production in the world into the forefront of people's minds. So when you consider all of those different kinds of environmental shaping events, it's important to be able to discuss them in a meaningful way. And we're going to go over that in the homework assignment. If you are following along in this book, which I definitely recommend, 
Um, you should read pages 1 to 9 and 1.1. And then try to respond to this IB style writing prompt. I want you to explain, using specific examples, the importance of cultural events such as books and movies in the development of the modern environmental movement. So give that a try, and when you are ready, we will go over the answer in the review video. See you there.